Okay. So today what we're going to talk about is ecosystem structure and then later ecosystem function. This is a topic that, um, so last week we talked about land cover and, and land use and QGIS and how to use that, that tool, right? That for me is a tool, okay? That's what Amelie does for her job academically and intellectually, okay? For me it's a tool. This is what I do academically and intellectually. Okay, I, I study ecosystems, their structure and their function and how they work. So I'm going to try to teach you guys a little bit about what I know about that and how it relates to ecosystem services and how we can use these other tools to better understand the structure and the function of the ecosystems that we're studying. Okay, so first we're going to start with ecosystem structure. And I put these, these graphics up here because I think it kind of emphasizes the word structure that we're thinking about. Okay, structure can mean a lot of different things. Tech, really what it is is the components that make up a system. Okay, the way that a system is built or the way that a system is put together. That's the structure of a system. So we can talk about the structure of an ecosystem here you have the different parts of the ecosystem and they all fit together somehow. We can talk about the structure of a building. Okay, it has its each different part and all together they make this system. Same thing with another ecosystem and same thing with a cell. Okay, even the tiniest part of biology has a very complicated and specific structure that makes it work. And when we understand the structure, and we understand what each part of the structure does, we can better understand how an ecosystem works. And when we understand how an ecosystem works, we can predict what's gonna happen to that ecosystem when certain changes occur. And so that's really important for management when we're trying to manage these systems. So again, a structure is basically just the arrangement and organization of interrelated elements in a material or system. And I'd like, to use, I'd like to point out that I use the Oxford English Dictionary here just so that um, Aaron doesn't get upset with me. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to be specifically talking about ecosystem structure. And really when I think of ecosystem structure, there's kind of two different ways that we can think about it. And two different ways that ecologists tend to think about it. The first that we'll cover is this kind of organizational structure. The way that the different organisms are organized within the system and how they all fit together. And then there's the physical structure. And so we're going to do some R exercises in both of these later today. We're going to examine the way that organisms are arranged in, the, in an ecosystem. And then we're going to examine the material, the way that material is arranged in an ecosystem. And both of those are really, can be very important and very informative when we're trying to understand how an ecosystem works and how, it's, how it functions and then how we can maybe predict what will happen to that ecosystem under certain conditions. So we'll start first with this ecosystem structure. Okay, who can tell me uh, an ecosystem is a biological community of, of interacting organisms and their environment. So those of us, some of us maybe come from an ecology background, some of us don't. For anybody that does, what is, this, what is ecology? What is the study of ecology? Great, perfect. It's the interaction of biotic and abiotic components. The interaction of the biotic components with themselves and with the abiotic components. Okay, so we have the biotic, the living components of a system, and we have the abiotic, the non-living components of a system. A lot of times we focus on these biotic components. And we sometimes maybe don't give enough credit to the abiotic components, but they're of course very important. So what are we talking about when we're talking about abiotic? What does that mean? Examples? Uh-huh. Non-living factors like soil. Soil. Okay. 
those can kind of be broken down into two categories. There's physical and there's chemical. So there's the actual structure, and then there's kind of the chemical characteristics of that structure. Both of those are important when, we're, when we talk about how organisms interact with their environment. They interact based on the physical, so oh, they bumped into something, so they have to go around, okay? Or they interact with the chemical, they tasted it, they touched it, it poisoned them, so they don't touch it anymore, okay? So they interact with both of those components. When we talk about the biotic, Again, there's two general groups. There's the autotrophs, which are what? They make their own food. They make their own food, right? Auto and troph. Troph we use to, to say energy, okay, or food. So auto food or auto energy, they make their own energy. What does that in an ecosystem? The plants, right? Plants make their own food. They take sun, and they take air, and they make food. And then there's the consumers, which eat everything else. They eat what the plants make, basically. And, and maybe many steps later, but somehow it all comes back to the plants. Okay, and I want to emphasize that. that the, the, everything is based more or less on what the plants are doing. So the abiotic, you know, that we can think of physical, temperature, precipitation, or chemical, pH, you know, these different properties. And there's an infinite number of categories that we could talk about when we talk about these things. Okay, so I'm just giving examples here. And then, of course, the producers are the plants, and the consumers, as I said, are everything else. The herbivores eat the plants. The predators eat the herbivores or the omnivores and the decomposers eat the dead material the material that is already dead all of those play extremely important role in how an ecosystem functions and we're going to explore some of those examples uh, throughout the day okay but this is ba this is the basic ecosystem structure this is what we're talking about and this is a very general structure we can get much, much more detailed. So again, I want to emphasize the importance of the producers. Okay, when we look at ecosystems, the producers often explain many of the patterns that we see, somehow, in some way. And not every case. This isn't the case for everything. Some ecosystems don't have producers present in that landscape. So somehow, the energy is, is coming from a different, a different pathway. Okay, but it's a very important concept in ecology that we understand this, this flow of energy. And in fact, I'd like to point out from one of my favorite books. So does anybody here like science fiction? This is a famous science fiction novel called Dune. It takes place on another planet far, far away. But they talk about this, they say the struggle between life's elements is the struggle for the free energy of a system. And people who look at ecology as a system, systems ecologists, they agree with this. This is how they look at ecosystems. They think about it in the terms of energy. How is energy moving through the system? Because that explains the struggle. When you, when you boil it down, or when you try to break it down to its basic component, why is the lion eating the zebra? For energy. Why is the zebra eating the grass? For energy. Everything is based on the struggle for this energy that's available. We're trying, every organism is trying to get the energy that it needs to survive. So that explains a lot of these interactions. So, in its most basic component, you have basically this ecosystem in which you have the sun providing energy to plants, the plants are providing energy to herbivores, and the herbivores and the carnivores 
And those are all breaking down into these decomposers. Okay, and these biotic elements are all interacting with these abiotic elements and that forms an ecosystem. They're all interconnected and they're all doing different things and we can say how much is flowing this way and how much is flowing that way and that helps us better understand how that energy is moving through the system and what would happen maybe if we broke this chain. If this function ended up somehow not working, then we can kind of maybe predict what would happen to the rest of this system. But more importantly, you can see here that what's at the top? The sun. Okay, everything is based upon this energy from the sun. With a few exceptions. Not very many. Maybe less than 1% of life on Earth is not based upon the sun. And those are organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, they have very hot water that's very rich in sulfur. And that sulfur has a lot of energy within its chemical structure. And these organisms have learned how to extract that energy from the sulfur. And there's entire ecosystems on the bottom of the ocean that are based on that energy. So there's bacteria that eat the sulfur. There's other organisms that eat the bacteria. And there's other organisms that eat the organisms that eat the bacteria that eat the sulfur. So that's, a, that's an example of an ecosystem that has nothing to do with the sun. Okay, if the sun were to go dark, they could probably continue functioning normally, at least for some time. Whereas everything else would die pretty quickly, right? There's another example, and I didn't know about this until I started doing this presentation, but there's this cave in Romania that apparently is sealed off from the rest of the world. And it has very low oxygen concentrations because all the organisms in there have used all the oxygen and no more can get in. And so you have these very strange organisms that live there and they're isolated from the sun. They're isolated from the rest of the world. And I don't know if really, maybe there's some sort of, maybe there's nutrient rich water that's coming in underground. And that, in that case, that nutrient came from the sun somehow. So it's not totally independent. Okay, but uh, it might be, and I think it's an interesting case. I would, I would love to see it and know more about it. But those are the really only two exceptions that I think we know of, in which energy is not, an ecosystem is not based upon solar energy. And so the basic idea is that these plants, they take solar energy and they put it in this carbon. They take carbon from the air, they take energy from the sun, and they use the energy from the sun to stick two carbon molecules together. And they do that over and over again until they have a carbon molecule that looks like this. Are there any chemists in the room? Does anybody know what this molecule is? Sugar. Okay, this is a simple sugar. This is the basis of energy for most organisms on the planet. They store this, and when they need it, they break these bonds, and that's how they get their energy. Okay, so it's all about this. And when we get oil from the ground, guess what it is? It's a little bit different than this, but it's basically a lot of sugar stuck together many, many times. Okay, and we just break this carbon inside of our engine, and it gives us the energy that we need to move the car. Okay, so you go from the sun to the carbon, and that's the fundamental basis for life on Earth. And so when we understand that, we can kind of understand more about how organisms are for competing for this energy. So we can look at a, an over ecosystem structure, for example, from the ocean. Where are the autotrophs in this ecosystem? The plants? Do we have plants in this ecosystem? They're not vascular plants. Uh, they're not even multicellular plants, but they're doing the same thing. Okay, they're using sun and they're converting it into energy. They're phytoplankton. Okay, phyto meaning 
sun or photosynthesis. So you have the phytoplankton that are forming the base of the food chain, the food web, or the base of the ecosystem. They're the ones taking the energy from the sun and making it into something where everything else can use it. So then comes the zooplankton. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. Zoo meaning what? Animal. Okay, then you have other larger fish that are eating the zooplankton and you get all the way up to larger fish and larger fish and then what's not shown up here is what? <laughs> Humans. Okay, they're missing from this. A lot of times they are. But they're here, of course, and they're eating everything. <laughs> okay, so the plankton are doing all of the work, they're doing all of the hard work, and everything else is using that energy for their own struggle. So this is a, a food web, or a food chain, or a trophic structure. Okay, we, we think of this as the, the, the first trophic level, the first trophic level is the base of the, the ecosystem. It's usually the autotrophs, but as I'll show you, it, it could be something else, depending upon how we define an ecosystem. And then every, every trophic level after that is based upon the trophic levels below it. So the next trophic level is the, the organisms that eat the first trophic level, and so on and so on. Another example that we're probably all familiar with here, an African savanna. Yes, question. Can you come back to the last slide? Okay, I'll go back to the last one. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the size of each? Yeah, yeah good. So Gabriela is asking about the size, right? And that, that's important because it, actually this, this diagram was drawn specifically to show that this is bigger than everything else. And that's because if you were to take the mass, of phytoplankton and compare it to everything else, it's far greater than the rest of the trophic levels and far more numerous. Okay, so there's far more phytoplankton than there are anything else in the sea. Why is that? Why can't there be as many zooplankton as there are phytoplankton? What's that? Then it means they would, they would finish the phytoplankton, right? So they would eat them all. So if there's too many zooplankton, then they eat all the phytoplankton. There's another reason, though. It's low high energy trophs. Yes, good. So another law of the universe is thermodynamics, right? We always lose energy. Every time we do something, we lose energy. So when the phytoplankton take energy from the sun, they're losing a little bit of energy. They can't use all of the energy from the sun. They lose a little bit. When the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, they lose a little bit of energy. So there's a le little bit less energy available for the zooplankton. And then so on and so forth. Every time we jump up in the trophic level, we're losing energy. We're losing it when we sweat. We're losing it when we breathe. When we chase another animal, we're losing that energy. And we, don't, and we, have, to, we have to eat more in order to get the same amount of energy. Okay. And that's really actually important. And it has a, that it says a lot about climate change, sustainability. One of the big recommendations they have now for everybody is to eat less meat. Why? Because we're eating up here. So instead of eating here, where we could eat the same amount and get more energy, we're eating up here, and it's the most inefficient part of the entire trophic level, the entire trophic food web, okay? We're wasting all of this energy that is lost in between. Whereas if everybody were eating down here, there would be a lot more energy available for everybody. So this is one of the reasons why they say, eat less meat. Every time you have to feed a cow to feed a person, you're losing energy. Whereas if we just ate the grass instead, we would have to eat a lot less grass to get the same amount of energy. What's that? You could also eat caterpillars. You could eat the caterpillars too. Okay. 
That's true. You don't have to go all the way down to the grass. You can eat the caterpillars. You're still skipping a couple steps here. Did you say something, Amali? I was going to say you need to eat the algae. Yes. You could, yeah. In any case, if we stop eating here and we start eating here, we'd be saving some energy. Okay? So that's why, one of the reasons why you hear this recommendation for climate change, to eat less meat. Question. Question. Okay. So uh, I'm very much interested by that recommendation. Okay. No, actually we are talking about uh, the overfishing because the, of the human population growth. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we go and uh, fish up, uh, at the Zooplankton River, uh -huh. we start competing with the fish. Yes. What will happen? Well, we're doing it. <laughs> we're already doing it. Okay, so we have nets that will capture these little f shrimp. Maybe not the plankton, but these little shrimp we capture. And we, in some places, they eat those. So because there's nothing left here. They've already eaten all of these. There is also a need to study the impact of that. Yes, absolutely. This is a really big problem that we don't hear a lot about either, is overfishing. We just saw it from the lakes in Uganda. Okay, we saw how the lakes were being fished. With time, we're using all of these. Usually when that happens, we move down and we start eating knees until they're gone. And then we move down again and we start eating knees. Okay, and that's what, they've shown that many times in many different systems. Once we fish all of these, we start fishing knees. Once we fish all of these, we start fishing knees. Okay. What's that? Soon we'll be at number one. Yes. Really? You'll just get a big bowl of plankton, and that will be your breakfast in the morning. So, of course, we all know this. Uh, you know, you have the plants getting energy from the sun, the herbivores are getting energy from the plants. The predators are getting energy from the, from the herbivores, and then they're dying, decomposing, and that's going back into these chemicals which the plants are using. Okay? It's, this is the Lion King in, the, in a graph, the circle of life, right? Then you see all of these. What's happening here with these little arrows? It's, they're losing energy every time. You're losing it as heat. You run, the lion runs after the zebra, it gets hot. That's energy that it's using to make, to make the heat. So it has to keep eating more zebras to get that energy back, right? So there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system. Here's another one. Okay, this is a much more complex way of representing an ecosystem where you're really trying to show every single step of the ecosystem. Question? One second. I get always confused about uh, the composers in the food or food chain. Uh, where exactly do the composers fall? Ah, okay, good question. So the question is, where do decomposers fall in the food web? Okay, because they're not producers, so they're not the first trophic level, but they're eating predators, technically, right? But they are eating predators uh, that are already dead. So, in a way, it's also the base of the food chain. I would put them uh, at the second level, okay, because they're, they're eating organic matter, basically. Okay, and the organic matter, whether it was made by the predator or by the herbivore, eventually, or sooner or later, you get back to the producers. So the organic matter always starts with the producers, right? That's where the organic matter is first made. Everything else just recycles it until it gets back to the, to the uh, decomposers. So I would put them here. But to be honest with you, I'm not a trophic ecologist, so many people might disagree with me on that. So maybe, maybe we should look into that. I'm not entirely sure. Good question. 
So this is a little bit more complex one. Okay, this is what's called a systems diagram. This is a very specific type of diagram that was invented by an ecologist called Howard Odom. And he's kind of formed a little community of ecologists who follow him and he's now passed away, but this is kind of this whole branch of ecology that he created based on these diagrams. Question? No, uh, I'm also confused with the scavengers and the the scavengers. So what are the scavengers eating? Dead stuff. Dead stuff, that's true. So that's another good example in which they're eating something maybe in here. Okay, so it all depends on what they're eating. Okay, if they're eating dead plants, then that means they're, skip, they're skipping a few trophic levels. If they're eating dead predators, it means they're in another trophic level. So when we do the exercise, we're going to see some examples of all of these and they do the calculations based upon what they're eating to show you the trophic level that they're at. But it kind of all depends on what they're eating. So here's an ecosystem again. Uh, you have these, the sun, you have tides, you have rain, you have river, it's bringing, the river is bringing in different nutrients. You have the soils here. The soil has organic matter, it has chemicals. There's nutrients, you have little organisms that are living in the soil, you have the water, you have also chemicals in the water, you have mangroves, they're producing a forest, there's other organisms that are using the forest, and then you have these things that are coming out of the forest. Okay, so this is a thing called a systems diagram that tries to represent an entire ecosystem. Where do humans fit into an ecosystem structure like this. If we were to look at the same ecosystem in a very urban environment, for example, we might see something like this, where the blue represents the, the human components. So here, you have people creating regulations. Regulations are a, a, a human concept. Regulations control infrastructure. Where can you build a road? How big can you build the road? How do you build the road? The way that you build that infrastructure changes how the river works. And it changes where sewage goes. And that changes how many nutrients get into the soil. And that changes how the mangroves grow. It changes how the tide works. And then at the end, you get all of these, what we call ecosystem services. Okay, so fishing is something that humans are using from the ecosystem. And that's going, in, that's going into the people again. And the people are selling that on the market. And then they're using that to drive their infrastructure. Okay, we had a question back here. Ah, okay, sorry. So here you see when humans are added to the equation, it becomes much, much, much more complex. But you can also see how this really helps conceptualize and think about how ecosystems work. When I look at this diagram, instead of just looking at a list of numbers, I can much better understand maybe how this ecosystem is working. I can say, okay, maybe if we didn't have so much infrastructure, maybe the sewage would be more uncontrolled or maybe less controlled, depending on the infrastructure. Okay? Or maybe if we didn't have as much fishing, we would have less ecosystem services going to the people. Or maybe if we didn't have as much plant biomass, we would have less protection on the shoreline from storms. So if I were to remove part of this, I can trace each one of these lines and kind of try to hypothesize about what might happen. What might happen if we removed mangroves? Well, we know that mangroves affect this, and we know that mangroves affect that, so it's going to affect all of those other components. And that from there, we can step by step kind of try to manage an ecosystem, thinking about what might happen if we change any one of these components. So this is the real power of thinking about ecosystem structure and its whole. Right, so we're not just thinking about mangroves. We're thinking about the mangroves in context with the soil 
and the water and the people because it's all connected right nothing in an ecosystem is independent from the other components of the ecosystem so if we change one thing we're probably going to change something else if not everything else here's another example this is a very human system okay you have mining you have manufacturing you have urban people commerce a forest everything's connected this might be at the level of a government government's not interested in a specific ecosystem but it's interested in how an entire government area functions how did the ecosystems in the area interact with the people in the area and if we were to change this forest how would it influence our commerce or how would it influence our utilities mining and manufacturing so this really helps governments also plan how their government is going to be organized or how their system is going to be organized it could be a big system or it could be a small system and so this again fits back into this general theme that we're here for on ecosystem services the ecosystem has its structure and its function those produce ecosystem services. We're going to hear more about those a little bit today, a little bit more tomorrow. Those produce, those feed into the human system. The human uses those ecosystem services and that influences how it interacts with the ecosystem. So the humans get fish, they like the fish, they make money from the fish, so they go get more fish. Okay, and you have this loop of interactions between society and an ecosystem. So how do we build an ecosystem structural model? Again, we have to start with the flow of energy. Everything is based upon the flow of energy. So I, can, I think of it as energy flows. So if we go on to, if we look at the sources of this information, there's a few different databases online. One of them is called globalwebdatabase.com. It's an online collection of food labs. And what it gives you are these things called predation matrices. And we're going to work with these a little bit later. Predation matrices basically tell you where the interactions are within an ecosystem. Typically you have the consumers, I'm sorry, the producers or the lower trophic levels on the left and the consumers are the higher trophic levels on the right. So, what do zooplankton eat? We go down, we find a one. One in binary means what? Yes. yes. Zero means no. So one, phytoplankton, of course. The zooplankton are eating the phytoplankton. What is eating the detritus and the benthic algae? The dipteran. Okay, it's just another type of organism that eats detritus, eats organic matter. So, again, this doesn't tell us a whole lot when we're trying to envision an ecosystem. But what I'll show you in the exercise is that from this, you can produce a map of an ecosystem and where the organisms fit in and how they're all connected. And you can look at the different trophic levels and you can determine what is the base of my food web. What is my top predator or top consumer and how, how connected are they to everything else? So let me just show you this uh, website real quick. So this is a great website because they, they have a really good way of searching through everything. You can look at the, some info here, some PDF info. But if you're really just interested in a certain taxa, certain organism, or maybe a certain continent, for example, you can download all of the food webs, or all of the predation matrices from that continent. You have to go through each one individually and kind of look at them. It doesn't give you a good description of each one. 
Okay, I think people just kind of global web, global f web database or db.com. So we're going to work with some of these. I downloaded some from Africa, and we're going to work with some of those later. Okay. So this one's kind of cool. It says, does it include parasites or not? Parasites are another interesting, we're talking about decomposers and scavengers. Where does a parasite fit into a food web? Right, it, it depends on, I guess, on what, it, what its host is. So you can say yes, no, okay, by year. Pre-1900, I'd like to see what that is. Maybe we can check it out. So that's, that's one example. This is another one. Interaction web database. Okay, again, it gives you this same type of predation matrix. Sometimes, you can see here, well maybe you can't see, it's too small, but this doesn't just have ones or zeros. It has other numbers. And those other numbers kind of signify how much is it using that resource. So if it's a high number, it means it's using that resource a lot relative to the other trophic levels. Sometimes they mean different things and you have to, you have to figure, each one of them has a, a paper, an academic journal paper that was published and you'd have to read that and look at the methods and look how they did it and make sure that it's appropriate for what you need. Okay, but they have, again, these different categories. You can do host parasite interactions, plant ant. Those are really interesting for ecologists. You have a lot of these plant ant relationships where ants are in a symbiotic relationship with plants. The most famous one from Africa, what's, what's the plant? It's a type of tree. They also have it in Central America. It's an acacia. So ants have this really interesting relationship with a lot of acacia species. The acacia species provide habitat for the ants and they usually make their nests inside of the tree. And the ants, as a present, and a thank you for allowing them that area, they chase away all predators that come and try to eat the acacia. And they attack the predators. So you can find different examples of these relationships. And then there's the usual. We talked a lot about pollination this week and last week. And they have some examples from, from Africa of different pollinator communities and how they interact with the rest of the ecosystem. So let me see if we can bring that up. So here it's organized again in a little bit more of a specific way in which you have very specific interactions that you might be looking for. Okay, but they also have a list of the different types. See, plant pollination is, a, is the, probably the biggest type of relationship that they have. So, you're probably not going to find your ecosystem here, right? But you're going to maybe find something that's similar to your ecosystem. And if you're thinking about your ecosystem, and you're thinking about maybe trying to map these trophic interactions, or map this structure, you can at least use one of these as a guide. And you can say, oh, well this system, they put the ants here, and the plants here, and the bees here, and if that makes sense for your ecosystem, then you could do the same thing. This is another one, but it's based only on freshwater ecosystems. So if you're working in lakes or streams or wetlands, then they, they'd have a, a list of different food web interactions for you. Okay. So these are just three examples of sources where you can find these different interactions.